Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Canada's Arctic Agenda, a Changing Strategic Landscape. I'm Andrew Erskine, Young Fellow at the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy. IPD is a Canadian nonpartisan think tank dedicated to promoting ideas that support diplomacy, constructing engagement, and prudent realism in international affairs. To assess in the discussion and shed light on the Arctic's regional dynamics and Canada's Arctic strategy, I have three distinct panelists. First, I have Dr. Petra Dulada, who is an associate professor and former Canada Research Chair in the History of Energy at the University of Calgary. Her research focuses on European and North American energy history after 1945, as well as transatlantic and energy and Arctic energy diplomacy. She has published on Canada's foreign and Arctic policies, transatlantic relations, and the concept of energy security. Before moving to Canada in 2014, she was a lecturer in war studies and international politics at King's College London where she also served as the research director of the European Center for Energy and Research Security. Next, we have Robert Hubert, who is a professor at the Department of Political Science at the University of Calgary. He also served as the associate director of the Center for Military and Strategic Studies. He was appointed as a member to the, to the then Canadian Polar Commission for a term lasting from 2010 to 2015. He is a senior fellow with the Laurie McDonald Institute, a fellow with the Center for for Military Security and Strategic Studies, and as a research fellow with the Canadian Global Affairs Institute. He has published on the issue of Canadian Arctic security, maritime security, and Canadian defense in multiple Canadian-based academic journals. He was the co-editor co -editor, sorry, of Canada and the Changing Arctic, Sovereignty, Security, and Stewardship, and Breaking Ice, Canadian Integrated Ocean Management in the Canadian North. Lastly, we have Thomas Axworthy, who has a degrees from the University of Winnipeg, Queen's University, and the University of Oxford. Thomas has had a distinguished career in government, academia, and philanthropy. He served as the principal secretary to Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau. He has also held teaching positions at Harvard University's Institute of Politics at the John F. K. School of Government and was appointed chair of the Study of Democracy School of Public Policy Studies at Queen University. He is currently the chair of public policy at Macy's College and a distinguished senior fellow at both the Monk School of Global Affairs and Macy's College. Welcome everyone. Afternoon. For yeah, everyone joining us, for everyone joining us today, we will be monitoring the chat, uh, the chat board throughout the webinar. So if there are any audience members out there who have particular questions or have anything that they would want to share with us, please write it there and we will get to them during our audience questions. Canada has a choice when it comes to defending our sovereignty over the Arctic. We either use it or lose it. Canada's Arctic, sorry, Canada's Arctic is central to our national identity as a Northern nation. It is part of our history. It represents the tremendous potential of our future. This quote from former Prime Minister Stephen Harper resonates with the current geostrategic dilemma facing Canada today. As a Northern and North American country, the Arctic is a key geostrategic priority for Canada due to its mainland and maritime Arctic offshore territories. The Arctic is also unique from a policy standpoint, as it transcends foreign, environmental, continental, and economic priorities for Canada and for the Indigenous communities that call the region home. The Arctic has been a prevalent factor in Canada's domestic political landscape as well, with the major parties using the region and its unique issues to uphold traditional attitudes for state sovereignty, environmental protection and research, Indigenous rights and representation, and with the effects of climate change, economic opportunities. The Arctic has also informed Canada's diplomatic thinking. During the Cold War, Canada and the United States joined in creating a bi-national continental defense treaty known today as the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, to counter threats from the Soviet Union, seeing as the Arctic provided the shortest pathway for missiles and bombers to strike North America. During the post-Cold War period, the Arctic was central for realigning the West and Moscow towards more peaceful and collaborative engagements. From this new alignment, the Arctic Council emerged in the spirit of working together to protect the environment and the peoples of the North. However, today the Arctic has witnessed major changes in its governance structure and to the, its environmental landscape, making it one of the most impactful regions for international stability and state prosperity. Due to the effects of climate change, the Arctic's polar ice caps are receding and offer more frequent ice-free summers. With more open waters available, new opportunities are beginning to be unlocked in the Arctic, most notably new shipping and cruise routes, particularly through the Northwest Passage, the North Sea Route, and the Transpolar Passage. The region has also an allure of fishing reserves, critical minerals, and energy resources, with the latter two making the Arctic a geostrategic priority for countries seeking a low-carbon and digital economy. With so much potential under its waters, the Arctic is becoming a coveted region for Arctic and non-Arctic nations. 
In 2022, the United States published its national, security, national strategy for the Arctic region, as well as resurrecting the U.S. Second Fleet in 2018 to counter Russia in the North Atlantic. Another Arctic nation, Norway, for it, for it, for it, for its efforts, sorry, published an Arctic strategy in 2021 that focuses on legal international frameworks for territorial integrity, working alongside the United States and fellow Nordic countries and the EU, as well as highlighting China's growing regional presence. This past summer, NATO Secretary General Jen Stoltenberg traveled to the Canadian Arctic, underlying the region's strategic importance for Euro security, for Euro Atlantic security especially in the context of a rapidly warming climate and rising geostrategic competition. The trip marks the first time a NATO Secretary General has visited Canada's Arctic. Non-Arctic nations like China and India have also developed Arctic strategies that aim to internationalize the region as well as, as, well as expand their, capa uh, their capabilities to project and administer their interest in the Arctic by cooperating with Russia for energy supplies and with liberal democratic Arctic nations on green energy, green technologies, food security, and low-cost digital networks. In 2019, Canada released the Arctic and Northern Policy Framework, which laid forward the Trudeau government's vision for a strong, self-reliant people and communities working together for a vibrant, pr prosperous, and sustainable Arctic and Northern region at home and abroad, while also expressing Canada's enduring Arctic sovereignty. Within strong, secure, and engaged Canada's defense policy, Ottawa has placed investments for Arctic expeditionary operations, Arctic-capable vehicles, space-based systems, and joint intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance research and development as priorities to enhance the Canadian Armed Forces' ability to operate in the region and adapt to a changing security environment. However, with a shifting geopolitical landscape, Canada is wrestling to find ways to manage, advance, and attain its national interests in all three of its geosecurity peripheries simultaneously. Only one needs to observe the multitude of international issues affecting Canada's strategic foresight, whether it's the ongoing Russo-Ukrainian war in Eastern Europe, reinstating the need for Canada's return to the collective security of the Euro-Atlantic community through NATO, the global economic rise of the Indo-Pacific, as well as the challenges posed by China's domestic interference and election meddling to Canada's inability to act alongside the United States in safeguarding North America, it is clear that Ottawa needs to restructure its geopolitical posture. Canada has already laid out an ambitious Indo-Pacific strategy, reinstated an effort to modernize its NORAD commitments, as well as demonstrating its resolve to uphold European security. But where does the Arctic reside in Canada's national interests, given the rapid changes to the global strategic landscape? Thomas, I'll direct this question first to you. You just recently published an article with IPD indicating how the Arctic is in Canada's interest. So can you elaborate on this point? Well, uh, the, the first uh, thing I want to say, actually, I'm delighted to be, to be on the panel and, and to be with uh, my old friend, uh, Rob Hubert. Uh, Rob uh, has, has probably more than any other single in individual over many years been pointing out the, uh, significant, the strategic significance of the Arctic and making pleas uh, for the country and the government to finally catch up. And perhaps they and perhaps they are. So I'm, I'm really building on things that uh, he's been talking about for a long time. But when you look at the, uh, at the strategic environment, uh, first of all, uh, the, uh, the broader strategic competition that we have, Russia and China and so on, uh, in the Arctic and in the North, there may be a chance of having significant uh, critical minerals, which are part of the future, both economic and, uh, and uh, military. Uh, something like their, Canada has 30 odd of these critical uh, minerals. They are heavily concentrated uh, in, the, uh, in the Arctic. So uh, an intelligent country would be putting in the infrastructure and the development, uh, everything uh, from uh, roads to bandwidth uh, to uh, try to make it possible uh, to have Canada as a safe, secure supply of these uh, vital elements, which may be part uh, of the uh, future competition with China in particular, and then with the uh, with uh, Russia. Uh, Russia, many Canadians still don't realize this, but we, uh, a neighbor of Canada, is not only the United States, but it is Russia across the Arctic Ocean. And as Rob has pointed out, they have, they have made massive investments in their uh, uh, Arctic uh, capabilities, uh, at least for the last decade. And, uh, and this is a potential strategic area of uh, confrontation with NATO. Uh, 
with uh, Finland joining, and we hope Sweden soon, the northern flank of NATO gets ever more important, and uh, Canada should be there to play a role. Uh, so for many, many reasons, the Arctic should have a tremendous primacy among our strategic goals. But, and I'll just end on this point, it's one thing to say that, that a region should be critical uh, to our uh, future security and prosperity. The second is, what are you doing about it? And here, the capability question, it's, it's just an, an embarrassment uh, that uh, we, this week that we're having this seminar, we find that Canadian uh, soldiers have to buy their own helmets in Latvia. We don't have enough aircraft to take part of, of a NATO um, admission. Uh, the Auditor General issued just a devastating report on our capabilities uh, in the Arctic, years behind in ordering needing equipment. It has to be replaced. We're gonna have to make do with gaps occurring. Uh, our, our neglect of the Arctic is really coming home to roost uh, this year as is our general neglect of the military for a long time. Thank you, Thomas. R Robert, we'll now, we'll now go to you. Um, as Thomas indicated, you, you have spent quite a bit of your time uh, as a professor and as, as, a, as a scholar researching and, and debating this discussion of the Arctic within Canada's strategic interests. So do you echo the, the items and the and the information that I would share with Thomas, or do you have a perspective, or do you want to just build off what was said previously? No, I think Thomas is, is dead on. Um, Canada faces three existential threats with its Arctic. I mean, existential. I'm not using it as a fancy sort of terminology that profs like to use. These are hardcore threats to our national security. Rich start, you know, I'm not saying national Arctic security, security. The first one, of course, that Thomas talks about, and, and I agree with him entirely, is climate change. Climate change is, is, is fundamentally altering the very nature of the entire Arctic region, um, let alone our Arctic. The melting ice is occurring. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not up for conjecture. Anybody who's been there can see it for themselves, but the, the numbers are clear. So that, that is an existential threat for fundamentally changing the nature of what is Canada. Andrew, you said at the beginning, we think of ourselves as sort of an Arctic nation. Well, it's not going to be as much Arctic to think about in, in that context. So that's number one. Number two is Thomas is dead right. It's, it's the geopolitical threat. I mean, I, to be perfectly honest, I'm not a I'm not one of those that thought that the Cold War ended. I think that we had a situation that we had the entry of an American hegemon that maintained its capability. It reduced them, but it never walked away from its anti um, anti missile systems in um, in in Alaska. It kept its uh, it kept training. It was about the only country that did keep training. And so you sit there and say, okay, well, you know, the Americans allowed Canada to proceed with the construction of the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy. That was the was the the, the really the beginning of the Arctic Council. We just really changed names in '96, and um, and we say, oh, okay, well, you know, we're into Arctic exceptionalism. That's what everybody says. No, because you then turn to Russia, and this builds on exactly what I, what uh, Tom was uh, was saying, is that Russia. With a GDP at that time, about roughly the Netherlands, and then when we get into the Putin regime, when he consolidates their, their oil and gas, the GDP goes up to about a, a level of Canada. With that level of GDP, they completely modernized their nuclear deterrent and war fighting capabilities, which is in the Arctic. And so, you know, we can we can talk to celebrate the, the uh, Russian cooperation in the in the um, uh, Arctic Council and the AAPS and the Coast Guard form. But the reality is they never moved away from the core security foundations of their policy under the Soviet Union, but also under Gorbachev and Yeltsin, which was to maintain that that strategic nuclear capability. But when Putin comes in, he then adds onto it a development of all these weapon systems where everybody is saying all of a sudden oh they just appeared overnight oh the world changed february uh 2023 bs the russians have been developing just to follow on what thomas was saying and what thomas raises in that very good article that he wrote is of course that the russians were developing these weapon systems to counter the american systems that were developed in the 1990s 
and that the Arctic never stopped being a core geopolitical environment. And that leads me to the third threat, and that is this continuance of so many of our political elites with a couple of sort of semi-exceptions that completely ignore the security threats within the Arctic. It's, it's, the Arctic is a performative art for many of our political leaders in that they can put their hand over chest and I like the Arctic sovereignty. I will do whatever is necessary. And they do dick all. We are in the situation. We're finally building a, co we actually cut steel on a, co on a Coast Guard vessel that we said we we're going to build on September 10th, 1985. I mean, that's that that's how serious we, we, we take these particular issues. And so we have these political elites they do the performative art. They all sing, oh, Canada, we stand on guard for thee. Just don't ask us to pay for it. And so you bring those three together, climate change, geopolitical, at the nuclear war fighting level, and in a, a political elite system that just simply doesn't act. And those are the three threats that face the Canadian North. Thank you, Rob. Petro, we'll, we'll go to you. And I, I'm... I'm sure you have a unique kind of perspective on this, having, you know, been in Canada and also having some time in, in Europe as well. So you get to see kind of two different perspectives of what the Arctic is. Um, when it comes to the, the Arctic and Canada's national interests, in your opinion, why is it uh, a particular priority that Canada should invest more in? Well, I also like to answer this as a, as a historian and someone who's interested in larger sort of foreign policy. And uh, what I would say is uh, there's no question that the Arctic in one way or another is in the national interest of Canada. But the next question I would then pose is how does it fit with fit within the larger foreign policy commitments? And I, you know, not to defend necessarily political elites, but you have a lot of things that you, you know, have to deal with in terms of a foreign policy in a changing world. So, um, and uh, the best example, I think, uh, Rob, you just mentioned, climate change is one of the essential threats. Absolutely, but the issue is you're not fighting that particular threat in the Arctic. That particular threat, you would be fighting where, right, uh, uh, all those emissions are created. So I see how, um, there, you know, the issue is not necessarily should there be more capacity, should there be more happening in the Arctic. The question is, can there be? What are the, you know, limited funds available? In an ideal scenario where you would have as much money as you need, you would definitely, of course, do this. But you have to remember that the changing international security order happens in many regions and happens in very different thematic areas. And you have to make a choice. So I think, you know, it's it's legitimate enough at least to ask yourself how important should the Arctic be in that general portfolio of dealing with a changing international security scenario. So what I would say as well as a historian is uh, also, uh, you know, um, what do you do with that new, or as you already mentioned, not so new international security order, um, which is still evolving as well. This is the other thing. I mean, we, here we are all speculating what, you know, will, what, what will the world look like in five years, 10 years time. And as we've seen with the pandemic, things can happen as a historian, we're much more comfortable with this that can completely change the way that we envision currently the future. So um, there are things to be said about not putting everything into one particular, you know, all, not all your eggs in one basket. You know, is it all focusing on hardware? Is it all focusing on a particular capability that you may need in the Arctic? So, and I would also say that while it looks very familiar to, for example, the Cold War scenario that you mentioned there, Rob. As a historian, I would also say history does not repeat itself. So while Russia may look very similar in terms of what they did during the Cold War, but they might even go back to a 19th century understanding of you know, national uh, nation states uh, rivalry, um, there are other logics out there. Right. Yes, Russia and China might still follow this logic of the 19th century, but equally, the climate change follows a completely different logic. And so I do think that, um, uh, you know, it, it's it's trying to get at the complexity and the nuances. Um, we all agree that if we had the money, that's nest, that's definitely what should happen in the Arctic. But we should remember that 
There are many other things that are currently really impacting the position of Canada in the world. And the one thing I would mention with the Arctic, be very careful because depending on how you focus on what you consider as the challenge, it becomes a North American circumpolar kind of logic or vision when maybe it should be something else. Maybe, you know, the Russian war actually shows us how you still need to focus on the uh, on the transatlantic. You still need to focus on the Pacific. I guess for Canada, the unfortunate position it finds itself in is it has three major oceans that it, you know, sort of is, is, uh, is bordering to when you don't necessarily have the kind of economic power or even, you know, population numbers than some of the others in that scenario. So, you know, it's, um, I yeah, is it in the national interest? Absolutely. Does that mean that this is where most of the money should go? Does that mean that this is a priority? I do not know. It's a choice you have to make. And I think you need to at least talk to everyone about why you would be making this choice because any money that goes there will not go elsewhere in your foreign policy portfolio. Thank you, Petra. And just continuing on, on history and and the perspective of the Arctic being a priority for you know the government that's in charge. I want to go back to the 2010 statement on Canada's Arctic foreign policy, uh, in particular the the exercising sovereignty and promoting Canada's uh, no, uh, northern strategy abroad. Uh, in the policy, it really affirmed Canada's status as an Arctic power and declared that sovereignty as the country's number one Arctic foreign policy priority. And when we're currently seeing the dynamic in the Arctic shifting, we're seeing Russia being much more muscular, much more uh, reaffirming that it is an Arctic power in the region. I would say we would have to recalculate how Canada sees the Arctic and how we see ourselves in the Arctic within the power classification in international relations. So seeing that can seeing as Canada is the second largest Arctic country by geography, as well as having the second largest GDP among the Arctic Council members, along with having a historical identity for being an Arctic steward, and with the emerging prospects of critical minerals and natural resources within our Arctic exclusive economic zone, I beg the question, shouldn't Canada be an Arctic power? And if it should be, would holding a status as an Arctic power provide greater opportunities for Ottawa to sustain its territorial maritime sovereignty, as well as compel it to acquire the needed hard power capabilities to reaffirm its continental and extra regional capabilities for Arctic security and stability that project into the North Atlantic and then into the North Pacific as well? Or would a, or would an Arctic power status hinder Ottawa's strategic posture in a, in a changing global and regional landscape? Tom, we'll, we'll go first to you. What are your thoughts on this? Well, uh, we certainly have an interest in the Arctic, but we're far from being an Arctic power uh, um, by almost any uh, criteria, domestic or international. Uh, our investment has been, you know, uh, not anywhere close to what is required. Uh, when we look at uh, food security, which is a huge issue uh, in the uh, in the Arctic, there have been uh, requests that uh, that uh, uh, they are. Uh, People, the Arctic citizens who live there, getting off diesel fuels, uh, uh, being assisted to set up greenhouses, uh, working on those sets of issues. Uh, there is still tremendous investment uh, needed there. Uh, the uh, Nunavut and, and its transportation needs. We talk in theory about a deep sea uh, port. Uh, we've, you know barely begun to have a refueling station, it's years behind. So, so um, to be a power, you uh, have to have capabilities and you have to have interest. And, and the argument I would like to make is, is the, the point has just been made, you can't have it all. Uh, I'm not sitting here saying, well, we have to spend this and we have to do this specific and so on. My case is that obviously, it, it, uh, we have not been spending enough uh, on, on military capability. That I can, that argument is absolutely uh, clear to me. Um, we have to do more. But within that, then I want to make the case that investing in Arctic capabilities, in particular, yes, we've got lots of foreign policy interests, but investing in Arctic capabilities in particular will do at least uh, two things. The first is 
uh, it will help our relationship with the United States if we actually stepped up and can make a real contribution, whether it be ice breaking, warning, uh, the other kind of capabilities that we may need there, uh, specifically in newer kinds of, of uh, equipment. That is a, a shared responsibility with the single most important priority of, of Canadian uh, foreign policy, which is maintaining a, a healthy relationship with the United States in terms of sharing. And then secondly, on the transatlantic issue, uh, Sweden and Finland joining with Norway already there is going to make, I think, large changes within NATO itself. And NATO has never had a, a particular interest uh, much in the northern flank and perhaps Canada and others haven't been much interested in them taking an, an interest. I think that's all going to change and uh, and that you you may start to have a uh, great cooperation between those countries uh, which have the northern dimension and which uh, you know Finland has now this long long border with uh, Russia. Well that being the case, Canada, which was uh, which was actually a leader instead of being a joke in terms of Arctic investment, uh, could also increase its influence uh, within the alliance, where I think people just shake their heads at us now. Uh, so, so foreign policy is complicated. Money is scarce. But my argument is that by investing in the Arctic, we help with two of the most important relationships, the American and the transatlantic European. And that if there is uh, new money to be spent, and there should be, we should be spending it in the Arctic where we can make a difference. It's our, it's our Arctic. <laughs> uh, there's very little we can do to influence the Chinese dynamics in the South China Sea, but we certainly can across uh, the Arctic Ocean and the, the various uh, channels that are there. So for many, many reasons, uh, not just theoretical ones, this is the place to put our resources. Thank you, Thomas. Rob, we'll, we'll go to you. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm going to say, go on a limb here and say that you sympathize with the remarks made by Thomas. Uh, I know that in some of your articles uh, published by uh, McDonald Laurie Institute, you've really remarked that, you know, as uh, Thomas kind of reiterated, you know, the Nordic uh, NATO members have been very prominent in their northern flank capabilities, um, establishing uh, different dynamics, different capabilities, uh, particularly Norway in 2018, it established uh, security arrangements to coordinate their security policies and operational capabilities with Sweden and Finland. So what are your thoughts on this? Does, uh, does Canada need to become an Arctic power or does it just need to develop the capabilities to be a prominent Arctic power when it comes to security and defense? Yeah, well, uh, excellent question. Um, you know, where, where where do I pick up the threads after such such great answers from both Thomas and from from Petra? I mean, to Petra's point about history repeating itself, uh, you know, as a political scientist rather than as a historian, my question always is, well, why does it do that? And of course, as a political scientist, it's because there are certain core variables often within a certain region and geographical area that re repeats itself. That it's sort of like asking, well, why is the Arctic remaining the strategic important location? It's because you have two existential states that see each other as an existential threat to each other. First of all, the Soviets versus the Americans with its allies. And then that's followed by the Russians versus uh, the NATO alliance. You also have a weapon technology, and that's based around a delivery system that cannot be defended, i.e. ICBM missiles, missiles in, in effect with nuclear weapons. And so the reason why so much of this looks familiar is that many of the core variables that shape it or have been shaping it since at least 1962-63 remain fundamentally unchanged. The technology levels change, but the fundamentals, in my view, does not. So, I mean, Petra's absolutely right on that context. Now, the part where, of course, we're following on Tom's on, on the identification of Canada as an Arctic power, uh, Canada does not act in any way that we can identify ourselves as an Arctic power. We do not have I mean, even you mentioned the fact that the, the 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 current government has issued a framework, and it is a framework. If you read the actual documentation, really, its major selling point 
is that it's offering a different way of interacting with the with the uh, the other actors, mainly focusing on the northern Indigenous peoples and the territorial governments. And so, really, what it is much more than a policy in any conceivable manner is it saying, well, this is how we're going to get along. This is how we're going to create it. And so we have to be, you know, we're not even willing to say, well, what are Canada's interests? Uh, previous conservative and liberal governments have been very willing to come forward and say that, yeah, these are our core interests. Usually sovereignty protection is at the top, followed by economic prosperity, sometimes then environmental protection follows, and the respect for the Northern Indigenous peoples. Now, they put them in different orders, but we've had all previous governments that say, this is what our interests are, beyond just saying that we have to have power politics. With the current government, we simply don't know what the interests are. So how can you have any form of um, a, be, a, uh, be an Arctic power when you don't know what that power is for. And so one of the greatest challenges that we face since this government replaced the Harper government is that we can't talk about it as an Arctic power because you use power for something. I mean, if you turn around and say that the core element is the protection of the environment, okay, well, fine, and you're focusing on climate change. If you're saying, no, we're cognitive also of what the Russians are doing and we have to respond to it, well, then you're talking about in terms of it. And if power becomes a means to achieve those interests, now, as Tom has pointed out so eloquently, we haven't done anything really to get that capability. Um, we, we, you know, if you look at the actual expenditures that we've had in terms of re remedying human security issues, particularly with the Northern Indigenous peoples, suicide rates, the, uh, the provision of uh, medical services, everything, every criteria of what a human security power would be isn't there. The, the North still has the worst statistics. If you go to the hard security understanding of what you'd use power for, everything is promises. I mean, we go back to strong, secure, and engage, which gave some indications of having a Northern defense policy. And of course, the, the, what everybody knows is that there was no funding provided. It takes until June of last year that we finally say, okay, we're going to get serious about NORAD modernization. But even, even journalists such as Murray Brewster and Mercedes Stevenson's have pointed out that a lot of, well, all that money that was promised in the June really was just the new money that was promised in the, um, in the budget back in April. And if you read really carefully in terms of what the government is doing, all of the big money is going to be spent in six years when there's another government um, in power. I mean, in six years, we know it's either going to be the Conservatives or a replacement to Trudeau. And so our record of showing power for something is not there. And so if you don't have power to do anything, if you don't have an interest to protect and you can't define that, how can you have a power? Now, again, to, to, to your observation about the, um, the Europeans, Europeans, the Nordic countries deny it, but what we see being created right now is a Northern branch of NATO. Uh, the agreement that you made reference to is Nordicum, and it basically is bringing together all of the Nordic countries, and this was including Sweden and Finland, even before they joined or were trying to join NATO, in terms of a common commonality of aerospace and maritime protection. You know, it's starting to look a lot like a European variant of NORAD, and they also have the Americans. Each and every one of the Nordic countries have individual agreements with the Americans where we're seeing, be, you know, we're seeing Norway allowing American attack submarines to come into Tromps. We see the Finns allowing B-2s and B-52s to operate from Finnish territory. And so that we're seeing uh, these countries getting the avenues, getting the instrumentation of power. And once again, just to, to, to illustrate the point, this isn't Arctic specific, but NATO is running its biggest aerospace uh, exer joint exercise that it has ever had since the end of the Cold War. It will be running for two years. It's based in Germany. Um, out of NATO, NATO has 31 members. Out of those countries, six of them don't have air forces. So you have uh, countries like uh, Mon Monterey, uh, you have Iceland and, and, and four others that don't have an air force. They're not participating. Portugal, that has some F-16s, is not participating. And the only other country that is not participating is Canada. And so you sit there and you say, you know, how can we talk about ourselves as a power 
when we have no instrumentation and seemingly no will political willingness this is a political decision i mean the the, the air force will want to be there to cooperate but the you know our political elites say hey you know what we're going to we're going to buy a whole bunch of leftover australian cf18s that probably are 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 are, are, are the challenge to fly uh, we'll postpone the F-35 decision as far as we are. And so we have no instrumentation. We don't have it on the so uh, human security side. We don't really have anything on the environmental side. And we have nothing on the geopolitical. So to, to, to suggest that we currently have anything that can remotely come close to having us as an Arctic power, well, we just, we, we've we made the, you know, it goes back to Petra's point. The political decision has made we'd rather spend the money on, say, CRA repayments to to basically buy ourselves into another re-election. Re now, I know I'm being really cynical on that, but we look at the amounts of monies that were, uh, were provided for COVID relief in terms of providing access to funds. We are going to be paying that off for a very, I mean, go read some of the st great stuff that Jack Minsk has written on this in terms of decisions we made. So Petra is bang on. We have made the decision that we are willing to put Canadians into hawk to basically do whatever you're going to do with that with that CRA funding and other types of related funding. And we're not putting it into the, the defense, as Petra has so eloquently brought forward to our attention. And that tells us that we have no political willingness to engage, as you describe it, as a as an Arctic power. And, and just to throw in one last point, we have people like Heather Exner Perrant, um, whom I think you've had on before, illustrating that we are by far the worst in terms of any economic development when it comes to any type of resource. And I, we go back to Tom's point about the, the critical minerals. I keep wanting to call them strategic minerals because that's what we used to call them. Names sometimes are important, sometimes they're not. But as Heather Exner Perrant has pointed out, we are the worst record of all the you know of all the European American states. We take the longest to bring mines into actions. We are the most restrictive. We have a system that basically is driving out um, uh, is spending in the north, and that gets into the issue of economic security, particularly for the northern peoples. As once again, her research points out. This is something, you know, you, you, the, the surveys are showing they want economic security rather than simply turning the Arctic into a parkland. And so we come back to, to Petra's point. The decision has been made not to make Canada an Arctic power. Thank you, Rob. Petra, we'll now go to you and we'll pick your brain a little bit when it comes to the historical position of Canada uh, throughout. It's, it's relatively, you know, short uh, or new history as a nation where has this dilemma over you know being present in the arctic being a pivotal player in the arctic or being an arctic power as we've been discussing historically for for canada and for political leaders um where does that topic lie and does that kind of inform or does it have any rhythms for where we could potentially be going in the future yeah, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say, Rob, I did not say that, you know, the current government has made a decision. What I say is that any government will have to face a tough decision in a changing international system where there are so many issues and challenges that you have to deal with. And before I talk about the historical piece, I also wanted to to sort of the question about Arctic power is really one about should it be, because obviously we are not there. Um, so it's very aspirational, and I think we need to acknowledge that. And the question is, is it useful to have that aspiration, for example? Uh, what does it do? I mean, is it more about using uh, a term to hopefully, you know, get more uh, of funding in that area? But I would also suggest that if we focus in on the Arctic power versus Arctic nation, it is still that outfacing dimension of an Arctic policy. Now, I've I've mentioned in my first uh, uh, intervention here that, you know, it's a part of foreign policy, it's only one piece of many. But then on the other hand, Arctic policy, it's such a unique policy field because it is of course not only foreign policy, as you've just heard, it's development policy, it's indigenous policy, it's industrial policy, it's many more things. And so I, I don't think it's particularly useful to even talk about, you know, should we be an Arctic power? Should we portray ourselves? I think what we really need, really need to be aware of how 
interconnected and intricate as you've already heard, an Arctic policy is that both faces outside in a changing international scenario, but also deals with massive challenges and opportunities within that region. And I wanna pick up on a few things here. Um, the one is of course, um, the question of you know uh, um, the the argument that Heather uh, Axner Perot makes, um, but you know you have to remember if you're in the European Arctic, infrastructure is much more built out. It's a lot easier to actually have uh, um, specific you know uh, mining of of of, uh, of resources because you already have an infrastructure there. Um, in general, the European Arctic, you know is lucky in that sense that if you've ever been there and Rob, you know that, right? I mean, comparing the Canadian Arctic with the European Arctic, there are a lot more people there. There's a lot more infrastructure there that historically is just a lot more because people have been moved there in the Russian case, for example. So that's already, I think, you know, it's a bit unfair to, to make that when you look at the fact that they don't start at the same kind of benchmark, right? In terms of what is already there. Now, um, the other issue is, of course, that we talked a lot about, you know, northern communities, indigenous communities, and um, I'm always glad to hear when we talk about investing in the Arctic. My question is, though, twofold. When we talk about security here, what kind of security exactly are we talking about? For who and by whom? There's not necessarily that the federal government or the military is the one that should be mainly be invested in in the Arctic. It's possible to think about other things, like is it military hardware or is it more, I think what Ridley Lackenbauer calls, right, the soft military side, the search and rescue, uh, the surveillance, the monitoring, you know, the, the technology that's more about radar uh, uh, and about uh, satellites and all this. But the other thing is also, should investing in the Arctic mean invest in relationship and trust building? Because, I mean, we are now at a stage where, yes, there are many communities who want to see development, but they're equally indigenous communities who want to do it on their own terms. So you got to talk to these communities. You got to find out what it is, what they want. Now, knowledge and expertise, that's capacity building too. When someone in the in the Q and A ask about, you know, should we make Canadians more aware that we are an Arctic nation? Well, I guess that's part of the issue. Being Northern nation isn't the same as Arctic nation. I always feel right. It's easy to be Northern if you're north of the United States, but for most people, that doesn't necessarily translate into knowing about the Arctic or even the subarctic. And you know. As someone, I don't know how, how well social engineering works. If, you know, if Canadians are, are not interested in really knowing what's going up there, it's not that easy to make everyone aware of it. It's, it's one thing to want to be a Northern nation or power. It's another to really know what's going on on the ground. So capacity building, I think, can happen in various ways. My last point as someone who works on sort of the energy side of things and has seen, of course, a lot of historical discussion around investing in energy resources. For me, the interesting thing here is that when we talk energy resources, a lot of the latest talk is about the new energy resources, right? Renewable, sustainable. So to replace diesel, which is a huge problem. There's energy poverty in the region. Mm -hmm. Critical minerals for me, that's more speaking to an old regime of exploitation. Now, the biggest issue I find is you may provide the infrastructure that attracts corporate actors. But because in the Canadian context, it is so, you know, compared to say other countries that have a lot more industrial policy, where the government actually plays a much more uh, um, uh, shaping role in some of these, you know, peripheral regions and trying to attract, that is actually not the way that, for example, Canadian energy industry or even Canadian mining industry works. And you have to wonder, is it enough to attract these actors to provide infrastructure? Because I'm not too sure about this. When we look at the latest rounds where the federal government tried to you know, sell drilling rights in the Arctic, the corporate interest was almost zero. 
And when we talk about, you know, the problem that the Chinese might be interested in establishing mines, the biggest issue is that there aren't always Canadian or North American competitors who are willing to do and invest in the same way. So I wonder if, you know, if you're serious about this, then it cannot stop at providing the infrastructure. Then you really need to have to rethink what is it that keeps those, you know, free market corporations away from going up north. But equally, you need to find a way to find out what each community's interest is because they vary massively in that area. So, you know, the suggestion I make is don't worry about the Arctic power thing. I think that's a lot of discussion of, you know, you are not the United States, you're not Russia. Um, do worry, of course, what your footprint is in the Arctic, but really start talking about what kind of security are we looking at? Is the best investment in the Arctic investment in military hardware, or should this be only one piece of a much larger sort of Arctic policy? Thank you, Petra. And it's your discussion and everyone's discussion is a perfect kind of leapfrog into our next question, which I, I want to bring back what Petra said with this kind of generational kind of understanding of, 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 of the Arctic and how we view the Arctic. And I also want to bring it back with what Rob said with the Cold War kind of heritage that the Arctic has. Since the end of the Cold War, the Arctic has been a noble region for collaboration and peaceful engagements for Arctic countries, particularly through the Arctic Council. Um, as Rob has pointed out earlier on, you know, this Arctic exceptionalism, which has been coined out of this, if you see what certain experts are writing uh, here in Canada, in the United States, and then within Europe, is under threat by the recent development of, of Russia seeking to elevate its securitization or militarization of the region, along with its defensive posture in the Arctic, which I may have to add is Moscow's largest geostrategic geo flank. Uh, I think roughly 53% of the Arctic you know, falls within their periphery. Um, so clearly it is a vulnerable uh, geosecurity uh, I guess the section of, 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 of Russia. Um, so to essentially demonstrate its ability to one, defend its Arctic claims, whether it be within the Maritimes or territorial sovereignty, but as well as uh, demonstrating its deterrence capabilities, right? Launching large scale military operations, able to stage large amounts of uh, military personnel and, and assets, whether that be icebreakers, uh, ice patrol ships, uh, or their ballistic submarines. This is, a, a, I would argue, a new strategic shift or return of a, of a, of a much more conscious military and hard power uh, Arctic uh, perspective. So by recommitting its efforts to underpin its top tier Arctic power status in lieu of growing economic sanctions by, by the West, and with Sweden and Finland, you know, joining NATO, obviously Finland, we're still waiting for their, their confirmation. And with the Arctic 7, you know, disavowing Moscow's participation in the Arctic Council due to its invasion of Ukraine, how does the Russia's, the, the Russian much more muscular militarized uh, posture within the region, how does this affect contemporary governance structure of the Arctic as, you know, as it once was coined, a zone of peace, and how does this directly impact Canada's Arctic interest? Rob, we'll switch things up. We'll start with you on this. Well, you realize to a large degree, your second question answers your first question, uh, <laughs> because ultimately what we are talking about is why is it in Canada's interest to be concerned about Arctic security in a geopolitical context? And what we know, once again, going through the open literature, is that the Russians made the decisions, and we can trace it back to about 99. Remember, that's when Putin takes power as acting president. He then gets elected and goes through the three of the, the, the various terms on that. What we do see from the open literature is, of course, the development of the certain types of weapon systems that the Russians were conceiving of. And we can see clearly that they were looking at what the Americans had and had illustrated in terms of, say, the Patriot system, the, uh, the inter, um, intermediate uh, systems, and the, the American ability to have strategic defense. Remember, that was the essence of why they were doing so many of these systems to develop. Well, what we see the Russians doing 
we can trace the development of the Poseidon, which is about a 2002 is when they start investing in that. That's the that's the unmanned uh, torpedo that's atomic powered. And, you know, is it effective yet? Don't know, but it's there. We can talk about the hypersonics that the Russians are developing, both the ones that they married to the MiG-31, but also the, uh, the ones that they can fire from the submarines. All of these systems, once again, are clearly made to be able to defeat American systems. Now, you can turn around and you can make an argument that those are defensive systems, but I think the overall assessments of, of, of all of our allies is that these are offensive systems. Now, see, it comes back to the Arctic. And this is why, in fact, it's not discretionary. I mean, I know people will argue that, well, what we do in the Arctic is discretionary. We've got a whole bunch of other uh, things that we should be doing. The problem is, of course, is that if the Russians are, in fact, inventing and reinventing and redeveloping their nuclear capability with a focus of first and foremost on their deterrent forces. So let's be clear. They're talking about defense. If they want to basically be able to deter the rush of the Americans and presumably the Chinese in the future because they will face a threat from the Chinese going into the future. Geography, technology means that the Arctic, as you say, the militarization that's occurred is around the Pecola Peninsula. At the same time, once again, Russia has reactivated 20, over 22 bases along its northern areas. Part of that is for the Northern Sea Route, part of that is constabulatory. But each and every one of those bases have a war fighting capability that we've seen. And so we come back to the point that the, okay, you can make an argument, you can make the Mersheimer's argument that the Russians did this because they were fearful of what the Americans were doing. Or you can just say the Russians are an expansionary power. There's also that argument that people like Waltz and others have made. So there's a contention in terms of what the intention is. Okay, fine. I accept that. But the reality is that they have re-energized that whole the nu nuclear balance. Now, you throw that into the fact that the Russians have had a series of military extensions of their area. They start with the Chetnians in, in 99, the Georgians in 208, and then they start the Ukrainian war in 214. And so, okay, we start getting concerned about that. But here's the kicker. When all of a sudden Putin finds himself in the second phase of the Ukrainian war, he has been increasing the political threats about utilizing nuclear weapons. Now, you turn around and say, OK, well, that's political theater. That's not nothing to do with the Arctic. The problem is, if it was to spill, if he was actually to be serious on this, it's the Arctic region. So if you are saying it's political theater, but we're not entirely certain, you need to convince the Russians that old fashioned deterrence works. And this is what Van Herc, the head of Nora, uh, Northcom and NORAD has been trying to do is saying, look, we need to reconvince the Russians. They can talk and maybe, you know, hopefully it's all just rhetoric in terms of what they're talking about. But then you look at the weapon systems they have, which are based in the North. We've got to make sure that the Russians understand deterrence is there. You cannot talk about using tactical weapons anywhere, Ukraine, North, whatever. The problem is, is what happens if Putin is serious about that? What happens if Putin's mindset has gone beyond nuclear deterrence? Now, everybody hopes and thinks Putin is still on the nuclear deterrence. And so what we have to do with NORAD modernization and see, this is where I come back. It's not discretionary. We can't say, well, maybe we'll do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. We need ultimately to convince the Russians, no, deterrence has to stand. You can't fire and launch and expect to, 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 to persevere, as you are saying publicly. And so that's the first stage. But what the more terrifying stage, to go back to Herman Kahn, what happens if the Russians are thinking that, yeah, we, gotta, we are trying to figure out a way to actually have new nuclear war fighting, tactical sense, maybe Ukraine only, maybe we blind the Nordic countries and the Americans. We don't know that. That's the problem because we look at the systems and it looks like that's what the Russians are trying to devise. You then factor in the cyber warfare and the means that we see both the Russians and Chinese trying to take steps through social media and the other attacks that basically calls divide, the divisions, all the rest that we then say on that. And we come back to the fact that we say ultimately our ultimate security, just as it did during the Cold War, was to convince the Russians or the Soviets at the time that no, nuclear war just simply is not th thinkable. So all those, all that modernization, all that militarization that you've done in, in, in the North, fine if you're going to do it for a bastion. If that's ultimately for deterrence, that's great. We will deter you, you will deter us, and we won't go nuclear. But the problem is there are indicators for some 
that that's no longer the case. Hence, this is why it's not just sort of, well, it would be nice to have Arctic security. That's why, in fact, even this government that has been so reluctant to do anything, finally in June of last year said, yeah, we got to get serious about NORAD modernization. That's why, in fact, it, that's not discretionary because you can ask anyone. Military spending in the Arctic is the last thing that the Trudeau junior government wants to be doing. And the fact is, they are starting to at least promise to spend. Ergo, that's why the militarization of what Russia does matters. Thank you, Rob. Tom, Thomas, we'll, we'll now go to you in your kind of position on this. Um, having studied it for so long, is the concept of a zone of peace still prevalent in the Arctic despite the militarization of, of, of Russian forces? Um, and it, it's if it is eroding that kind of notion, how does Canada address it? Is it, as Rob said, is it looking at, you know, assembling with like-minded countries within NATO or with the United States through NORAD and looking at deterrence, uh, deterrent capabilities, or is it going through alternative uh, streams of, of, of resource funding, whether that be uh, ice-capable patrol ships, uh, increasing the size of our icebreakers? Um, and I think that point in particular is important because, among NATO members, icebreakers and ice-capable patrol ships are, you know, high demand but low density assets for for NATO. Uh, you know, Canada, the United States, Denmark, Norway, and then eventually Sweden, and then obviously with the incorporation of Finland, we have modest fleets of Arctic-capable vessels. Whereas Russia has an abundance of Arctic-capable ships, and they have close to forty icebreakers alone, some of which are nuclear powered. So, what is what are what is your perspective on this on this lens? Well, uh, to repeat some earlier points, that uh, whether we look at human security, uh, and, and, and that's food security and medical security, uh, the, the isolation of uh, communities, opportunities for young people, and so on, uh, there's a tremendous human security dimension to the Arctic and the, and the North, where uh, we are deficient on almost every variable. So there's an equity argument that there's a large percentage of Canadians living in a critical area who uh, are not meeting national standards. And therefore that requires a host of different kinds of investments. Uh, one of the most important being at the start, for example, uh, is broadband access. I mean, you can't have a modern economy or a modern mining industry or a modern military if you don't have the, the access to, uh, to high-speed uh, internet. Uh, anyone who's tried to uh, use the internet in the Arctic knows how, how often it is intermittent. Uh, that, that's the kind of infrastructure that we need. And there's a whole host of, of, of human um, investments. We, our, our governor general, uh, herself a, a, a tremendous Inuit leader has spoken about the uh, suicide issue and before she became governor general was leading a major campaign around that. So that dimension of life calls for greater Arctic investment. And then as Rod ha Rob has said, on the military side, uh, I'm, I'm not uh, arguing only for in increased emphasis on, on being serious about our military in the Arctic. I'm arguing for both because we're terribly deficient on both in this critical part of, uh, of, the, of the world. And uh, I'm just back uh, from a, a conference in Europe, I helped chair, where uh, we had uh, former president of the Ukraine, Yushchenko, presidents of Bulgaria, Latvia, and so on. And to hear them speak about uh, security issues and threats, it, it was so intense because it was so unreal. It was just, for, for them, this was not an academic theory uh, of uh, geopolitics, that they are uh, very afraid of what the future may be in trying to deter the Russian uh, Putin. And there, there is uncertainty about how far he will go with these uh, ongoing threats about using nuclear weapons. Uh, and, and so, I sat back and just thought of, of, you know, Canadians thinking about their security without a tenth of the emotional investment 
that these European leaders had because they see the real thing because they see the threats directly. Now, we're trying to make the argument here that there are equally significant threats right in front of your nose on human security, military security uh, from uh, Russia. Um, and yet trying to get any political will to pay attention to it, it begins to raise that we're, we're not a serious people about serious issues when, when we are blithely ignoring what is really so evident uh, to me. Last point is, is uh, because you mentioned the Arctic Council and uh, the, the zone of peace, that, that is and Mr. Gorbachev's original idea. Now that was aspirational and that made sense. I would still argue today that if we can, uh, like any diplomacy, uh, if you can cooperate uh, around search and rescue and cooperate around uh, uh, environmental uh, science and cooperate around uh, prevention of oil spills and so on, that just makes a huge amount of sense. And, and uh, the Arctic Council uh, formally is not operating because of Russia's uh, suspension. Informally, I would just make an argument again, we could begin and we can invite, for example, the European Union to join us on a whole host of Arctic science projects around permafrost and others. I guess I'm trying to make, make, make the point that we have a formal structure where, where one of its leaders is now a pariah because of, of what their uh, president has done, but we should continue a series of investments in the kinds of things the Arctic Council was doing with our European and American uh, uh, partners and, and keep that up. And if in, in time Putin goes or Russian uh, military threats are lessened, they can be invited back in. But I'm calling for a, a full scale press on the human security side at home, on the military, uh, inv serious military uh, investment and in international uh, uh, diplomacy uh, on Arctic Council kinds of investments with the European Union and the Euro Euro European nations invested to have a de facto Arctic Council operating uh, structure to continue its work in the hopes that eventually Russia uh, will be able to be invited back. Thank you, Thomas. Petra, we'll, we'll now go to you. Uh, and I'll, I guess I'll, I'll retweak it just a, just a little bit um just just so there's there's you're not re you know repeating anything or overlapping but kind of going back to your previous points of you know policy and the funds and the investments that are going to come from it are going to come from where the priorities of the government of the current day is uh and like you adequately said if you're going to invest in the arctic that means you're going to under invest in certain other areas that may be important given a certain time right this is that dial system effect where as soon as you increase uh, funding for one perspective or one uh, priority for Canada, you're going to have to decrease it from somewhere else. So with that in mind, you know, it, is it possible for us to have a balanced approach when it comes to, you know, uh, traditional notions of security, when we look at what Russia is doing in the Arctic, and then obviously given the human security, the energy insecurities that our, our North uh, is currently witnessing, and then as well as the lack of economic development or sustainable development in, in, the, in the Arctic, is it possible or is there going to have to be a different formula for us to really address the insecurities that we're encountering in the Arctic? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, balance approach is actually a quite interesting um, way of looking at it. I, uh, um, uh, I think it was in 2020, I was asked to write sort of uh, um, a brief for the European Parliament, which was, I think, a, we even called it a balanced Arctic policy for the EU. And um, so, of course, you try to bring together all sorts of issues. And, and the biggest argument here is that you have these two essential threats, climate change and uh, a changing geopolitical and geoeconomic. Uh, uh, um. And the one is kind of, you know, a 19th century security logic. And the other one is a 21st century security logic. And you deal with them very differently. So my, my issue though for Canada is, are you, you know, and I don't want to sound like um, that I'm uh, downplaying the capabilities that Canada could have, but are you really in the position in the current international security climate 
to actively balance, right? What you're doing. Aren't you limited by a lot of things that you don't even have any power over, that you need to react at any given moment? And so to just to pick up on a couple of things that we heard here from both Rob and, and, and Thomas, one is um, uh, Thomas mentioned, you know, the Europeans look towards the, the changing security and they make all sorts of decisions. And I'm a German, so I follow very closely what we have done in Germany. And I can tell you, yes, we see the same security threat, but we actually arrive at very different conclusions. And, and that is very important to remember that you may look at the same you know, new international security environment unfolding, but for various reasons, you actually make very different conclusions. And that might be because historically, you have very different ways of looking at it, your capabilities might be different, but there's one other one, and that's the one that I would also mention in response to what Rob mentioned here. Yes, the Russians have attacked, but look at it, the Russians attacked neighboring countries that were not part of NATO. And, you know, there is, at least in the European discussion, there is this distinction that is made that, you know, yes, Russia is an aggressive state. Russia definitely builds up its capabilities. However, we do not think that they would attack any of those countries that are actually in NATO or that they would go as far. And I think it's it's legitimate to, to talk about this because if you look at the, um, 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 uh, if you look at the, you know, uh, the uh, Standing Committee on National Defense report, right? A secure and sovereign Arctic, most people who were quoted in there, including a lot of military people, always insisted there is no imminent danger or threat that we are attacked by Russia. And I think that's important to remember as you try to figure out what is it that you need to first address. So I, you know, I, and, and some people would argue, look at Russia, are they really that powerful as that uh, conflict unfolds at the moment? As an energy specialist, all I can say is, as you know, they rely so much on their energy production. They rely so much on the, on the energy price. In the long run, if they are only left with China as a partner, the problem is China doesn't have the technology. Eventually, and every energy specialist will tell you, eventually they will really suffer in the Russian case because they cannot tap into that very specific knowledge that you need for going more even into the Arctic and drill for oil and gas there. China cannot provide that expertise. And a lot of that expertise is Western. So I think it's a lot more complex than that. And the last point I would make is, I know it's easy to talk about the Arctic and just think about Nunavut. Like I feel a lot of the things that we hear about what the challenges are, what the human security dimension is. NWT, Yukon, very, very different Arctic regions. And is it really the federal government that should, isn't it more about how do we create capacity on the ground? Not how do we provide human security for the people in the Arctic, but rather how do we create more capacity, more trust and relation building for those communities who, is, who have actually decided through their various land claims agreements. And there's much more than noon of it. So, you know, all I'm saying is um, it's, there is no essentialist way of determining what that Russian threat should mean in terms of a response, because we see there are differences. The Europeans, some of them react very differently. And all, you know, I think we should just be aware as Canadians, there are choices, but what's missing, and I agree with, with, with the other two here, is there isn't really a good discussion of that. There really isn't something that allows every Canadian to participate in this as well informed as they should be, um, but also in understanding different time frames. Literally, who, what do we know what it looks like in 10 years from now? Technology, especially military technology, and, and Rob knows this much better than I, has a very long lead time. And sometimes these things are ready when they almost become obsolete. So, you know, it, 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 it is something where you have to be aware of some of these different timescales. But not surprisingly, as a historian, of course, I would say that. 
Perfect. Thank you, Petra. The, the concept of, of understanding and comprehending and then actually managing and acting upon, you know, our notions and our understandings of, of security dilemmas, whether they be nation centric, human security, environmental security or, or resources um, is, is unique in the sense that it kind of fits within the theme of the, the Arctic and the, being a changing landscape throughout different generations. So keeping, you know, with everything we just said, I just want to shift the discussion a little bit to the overall structure of the region and the dynamics, and in particular, discuss the Arctic Council. Now, speaking from a post-Cold War you know, generation perspective, when I think about the Arctic and I think about the governance structure and I think about you know, the, the interstate dynamics, I always think about the Arctic Council. Um, and for some of the, the, the audience members who are watching, I'm sure you know this, I, I apologize, but just bear with me. In 1996, the eight Arctic nations assembled in Ottawa to establish, you know, a high level intergovernmental forum to enhance cooperation, coordination and interaction on Arctic issues. Out of the Ottawa Con Convention that emerged, the Arctic, the Arctic Council was born. Since its inception, the Arctic Council has, you know, taken specific steps to incorporate the positions of Arctic countries, permanent Indigenous organizations and numerous international and regional working groups on sustainable development and environmental protection issues for the Arctic. Um, however, as has been you know, previously pointed out, with Russia being you know, disengaged in, 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 in the Arctic Council, th that does kind of set that whole regional structure in limbo because the Arctic Council is a consensus-based forum you know, with its projects requiring full member approval. And speaking on the security and the military kind of dynamic of it, the, council, the council's mandate explicitly excludes military and security issues. So with keeping this in mind, and um, kind of going on what's, what some experts like Andre uh, Ossingen, a senior fellow from the Arctic Institute has kind of remarked about the Arctic Council not being, you know, uh, not being the end all or be all of Arctic governance, instead being you know, one piece of a vast high north governance uh, structure. Is the, it, it, yeah, so with, the, with, the, with all that in mind and the, heart, the high military postures from all Arctic Council members, um, is the continuation of the Arctic Council still important, one for Canada, the rest of the Arctic Council members, and it's still integral for regional stability? Uh, Rob, we'll, we'll go with you. Okay, one, and you start, you, you preface this question about generational, and I think this is a, a point we have to reflect upon, because there is a tendency amongst most of our colleagues and, and many to almost to a degree mythologize what the Arctic Council actually is. There's a tendency of just saying it's a normative good onto itself. This is the root of Arctic exceptionalism to a large degree. Once again, if we take a longer term view at Arctic cooperation, we can see that there are discernible trends that have developed. Uh, I mean, once again, when we talk about the Arctic Council, we really have to talk about the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, because that's where it all started under the Finnish Canadian Initiative, uh, the creation of the working groups, the inclusion of the permanent participants, meeting every two years with your ministers. This is stuff that starts with the with the AAPS. And so we when you, part of this mythology that we've created is all of a sudden we created this brand new organization in 1996. It wasn't a, it wasn't a genesis of a new organization. It was an evolution of what people saw necessary. And once again, we look and say, okay, well, why why was that working? It was working because what it did is it brought together mainly the scientists but it also brought together the indigenous communities and gave them a standing, to be quite frank. The, Arctic, the AEPS and Arctic Council way precede anything in terms of UNDRIP, in terms of recognition of the rights of indigenous people from an international organization. You don't find any other body that has done it. And it did it very quietly and it did it effectively. And, and, and people like Mary Simon, our governor general, her along with Franklin Griffiths, and several other notaries from the Arctic were there. I think Tom even had his hand in some of the, the creation in terms of some of the elements. He might be too, too modest to, to acknowledge going back because he'd have to acknowledge how active he is back in 1990 and all that. <laughs> but the reality is, is that this is an ongoing element. And so 
we go through these phases. We go from 89 to 96 when the Arctic Council is really finding its footing. Now, it's called something different, and Canada likes to sort of push the fins out of the way. That's what we were doing, is because everything was retained from the Arctic Council. We really didn't change anything at all, except to call it a different name and say, this is the Canadian the Ottawa Convention. And so that, 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 that in Hen Hensick nationalism that we have kind of reared its head at that point but it was still doing the good science it had the arctic it was the one that led the world in terms of understanding climate change the arctic impact climate assessment you know did a brilliant job of making the case for climate change and in fact it, it, in my mind it even goes ahead of the sustainable development report that had been done uh, the, the Brundtland commission beforehand for climate change so that's why the arctic council was seen as so important but we go through the period then from 96 to, to basically 208, when people are, are, are turning around and saying, hey, this is really paying. And political, the difference between the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy from the 89 to 96 to the 96 to 208 is political elites start realizing. This is when Hillary Clinton as, uh, as Secretary of State and others start saying, hey, this is something important. And so political credence is given. When political credence is given, then you start having agreements that flow from it. You have the you have the 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 um, scientific agreement. You have the search and rescue. So you have a series of treaties because political acceptance. Then we get into the period about 2014 when the Russians begin the Ukrainian war. Canada starts to try to say, well, there's a geopolitical element here, and we have to try to 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 restrain Russia from this behavior. Canada is shut down. I mean, basically, when Harper tries to do this, all the other the other six Arctic Council countries say, no, you can't. You, let's try to contain the Russians by getting along with the Russians in the Arctic. And hopefully that's the means by which we restrain them. What, of course, happens when the Russians pick up the intensity of the war in 2023 all of the Arctic states, Canada included at that point, realized that it, it was ultimately a fool's errand to think that if we cooperate in the Arctic, that will restrain them from that behavior. My point here is that if we're being true to what the Arctic Council really represents, we need to recognize it represents the political environment that it is operating in. It will shift. Yes, maybe it will go the way that the G7, the G8 transformed to the G8. The G7 is still doing, you know, you, the work of John Curtin and others. G7 is still doing powerful work with the Russians kicked out. There's, we're going to, we're going to suffer on the science side, but nevertheless, we're going to see something emerge. We're going to see something different just as we've seen since 1990. And so therefore, I'm not in the camp of saying, oh my God, we got to retain the Arctic Council of exactly how it is. Because what are you talking 96 to, to, are you talking 89 to 96, 96 to 208? You know, tell me what you mean. Or are you just talking that one frozen in time of 2022 before the second phase of the war begins? And so we will figure that out. We will move forward. That's what our his, that that is what an analysis of the key variables within the Arctic Council and the AEPS tell us. What that looks like, it's going to depend on the Russian behavior. I mean, I hope Petra's right that Russia is going to just stay within certain boundaries in terms of its aggressive action. And if that's the case, then we can expect to see Russia will be brought back in. If in fact the Russians become even more aggressive. Um, or aggressors elsewhere, well, then, then of course it won't. But something will be there. The question is, how will it respond just as it has responded since 1989? And that's what you really have to think of. Thank you, Robin. And I will say uh, for everyone listening, the trans Russia obviously had the had the chair of the organization for the past two years, and they just you know made the change to Norway, who who currently had it for two years. And that transition, I know there was a lot of skepticism, and there was a lot of attention on it to see what kind of transition that was going to be. And you know, from all kind of reports, it seemed like it was a smooth uh, transition. And there was a communicate release that you know had Russia in there as well. So you know, if that is a precursor of things to come potentially, then there is still that avenue, that di regional dynamic to cooperate. Um, Thomas, we'll go to you and same question. Um, however, I was wondering if you could maybe specify a little bit more that uh, that if let's suppose the report reapproachment with Russia is on the table for the intermediate term due to its you know its war in Ukraine, 
should Canada and other Arctic partners pursue more legally binding agreements amongst themselves to guide and regulate Arctic activities? Something similar to the Polar Code, Arctic Fisheries Agreement, the, the Arctic uh, Coast Guard Forum, uh, in, in a way to essentially provide issue specific, uh, specific sorry, opportunities that mitigate you know, general nation centric insecurities that you know, we all face. Or if this was to occur, would this further divide the region into ideological blocks, making making the Arctic essentially a space more ripe for competition and potentially confrontation down the line? Well, uh, the the basic uh, goal you want to achieve is uh, cooperation. Uh, you want to have uh, states and uh, the private sector uh, and others try to align around a, a value system that makes sense and and as uh, rob has said uh, what was unique and so valuable about the arctic council framework is the creation of the permanent participants the indigenous peoples from all countries and all regions had a seat at the table uh, not not in a consultative capacity uh, that you could pick and choose when there would be an indigenous point of view but on all issues and played a very significant role um and uh, and we've talked a little bit before about communities on the ground and what they want and so on well at least in that international forum their representatives were uh, at the table and participating in the working groups so um uh what's key is about the work of the arctic council which was cooperation in a host of areas around the environment and the science and so on. And it, it never did uh, discuss, as you said, uh, the uh, security arrangements. Um, you know, back in the Halcyon days of the late 90s, uh, the Franklin Griffith, who's been mentioned, uh, you know, wondered whether um, arms control treaties in connection with the Arctic could, could uh, begin to be negotiated on uh, on uh, surface ship transit and so on uh, that that's long gone now but but the but the key is uh, uh, the cooperation in my view continue and uh, and there's a structure there that exists it's it's just a structure with some great principles there's a lot of investment has been made into it so you don't discard it easily but you pick up the work and you can and you continue it and all that can uh, you, you can continue working groups where Russia is not part of it. Uh, not all not all working groups have all uh, participants in it. So within the art, still within the Arctic Council, you can continue the working groups where Russia has not been a member, and we could fund those. On other issues, uh, you could de facto begin a whole series of cooperations, and the European Union has tried has tried to become an observer at the Arctic Council. It hasn't succeeded. My point is, I would be inviting the union itself to be a full partner in the ad hoc uh, organizations around a set of specific issues. So, my, uh, my stance is uh, continue and even increase the the science and the funding and the cooperation on an issue by issue bis uh, basis ad hoc. Continue all that work, and if at such time as uh, Russia reforms itself they can be invited back in. If they don't, then continue the ad hoc work, and then you might uh, create an, another new structure, uh, but keep up that principle. The best thing about the Arctic uh, Council was the, the recognition and the engagement of the indigenous voices. That should also continue in the ad hoc cooperative um, alternative to the council that I'm recommending now. Thank you, Thomas. Petro, we'll, we'll, we'll go to you before we head off to, to, to questions from the audience. Um, it, it goes without saying, though, would you, would you not say, would you not agree, sorry, that, that the Arctic Council is unique in the sense that it is a common theater for Arctic nations who have common values, common norms within Arctic governance, within Arctic specific issues. It's a forum for them to collaborate and to work alongside each other because there is that that tangible history, that is the, there is that tangible link between them all that they all share. And it brings up the issue of, you know, is there, can you really say that there's an Arctic Council if Russia's not in there? Um, but in lieu of this, 
And in lieu of the, the, you know, the A7 disengaging with Russia in the Arctic, this isn't stopping Moscow from diversifying its partnership in the region. We're currently seeing, you know, Putin reach out to its brick menders, noticeably China and India, who are who have already published Arctic policies and who are already observer states in the Arctic Council. So, Petra, I was just hoping maybe if you could bring a different perspective to this, in the sense that with you know growing interest by non-Arctic nations to operate within the high north and to collaborate and to invest in the development and into the securitization of the region. With having more participants in the area, is there a likelihood for the region to become what Elizabeth Buchanan says is an international sphere of problems? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, of course, you know, in the international system, we have different organizations. And this is indeed a, a very interesting organization that um, I would say is, is much more based on, as you said, it's intergovernmental on the one hand, but it has this really innovative piece, uh, as Thomas mentioned, right, of um, the permanent participants. So for that reason in itself, it's certainly something that um, um, should continue in that way. But I also feel that this is an organization that unlike other intergovernmental organizations, the kind of treaties or agreements that Rob mentioned they're still signed by you know, the national members in the Arctic Council. So there are essentially sort of intergovernmental treaties and agreements. And the issue here is the enforcement doesn't come out of the Arctic Council, right? I mean, the enforcement would be something that would be within sort of the, the, uh, um, the various partners signing the agreement. So that's very different and you can see it as a problem, but in, in times like these, you can see it as an opportunity because it's, you know, the Arctic Council does not run into the problem that it, it has to enforce something that is say against Russia. And this is why um, going back to the discussions we heard around NATO, I am not too sure whether all the NATO partners would agree with, broadening the remit of NATO to include the Arctic. Um, we know this has been coming up again and again, um, historically in NATO. Um, like, you know, I, I compare it to energy security. This is something that has also been suggested to be included as a NATO remit ever since the 1980s. And for various reasons, you always had particular partners in there who would not agree with that? So I don't necessarily see NATO actually agreeing on including that Arctic agreement, but that's something where you know we can disagree what we think is happening there. But it might be an opportunity for the Arctic Council that because it's more functionalist in one way, right? It really goes by specific issue area. So it looks at search and rescue, or it looks at oil spills, or it looks at environmental protection. Some of us, you know, in international relations would say that sometimes has more, um, you know, uh, uh, opportunities to be successful because it's very limited. It is based on very specific coalescence of interests. And I can see how the Arctic Council is flexible enough to say we stay away from those hard security issues for now. But we all agree that due to climate change, for example, we need to deal with X, Y, Z. So I can see how it being this kind of soft regime that also has a functionalist history in the way that it addresses issues can survive. And in, in addition, of course, because of the indigenous permanent participants, which is a really sort of innovative piece in international organizations. But um, so uh, I think that 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 is something that the Arctic Council uh, um, could uh, um, go ahead uh, with and, and, and really be um, very successful there. Um, the last point, all these other, you know, uh, countries that are not in the Arctic and have Arctic strategies, I also think you have to differentiate the various reasons. You know, um, China has a specific uh, interest, as we know, in terms of resources, shipping, and all these things. But there are other countries, I think, who do this because they realize it's become this international issue. And like, you know, countries who joined the Antarctic Treaty, you know, decades ago, who had nothing to do with the Antarctic, what they realized is, if we wanted to show that we are an international player, we need to join all those agreements that seem to be the important thing nowadays in the global world. And I do think we have to be very specific. Some of these countries, that's their rationale. We got to be part of all the important, you know, which is good. It shows how important the Arctic Council has become. But 
you know, be very specific about why would certain countries actually wanting to be part of it? Is it because they really have an interest in the Arctic? Or is it because they're jumping onto the bandwagon of the Arctic is now the next hottest international issue? And if we want to be taken seriously as a middle power or something else, then we better be part of that as well. Do we have expertise in this? I don't know. You know, do we have? And so, and one last point, I would disagree with you. I don't think that from the beginning, the Arctic Council members shared common values and norms. What they shared was common interest and geography. And it is actually through the organization that there were a lot more opportunity to exchange and to learn. And that's what helped sharing norms and values. I don't think that's how it started. I think that there was a lot more, we share similar problems in a region, in a geographical region that we all are interested in, but there were very different values and norms when this was founded in 1996. And even as the Canadians realized, as compared to some of the Scandinavian countries, right? Uh, sometimes you have more um, similar interests to Russia than say to some of these others. That's the interesting thing about the Arctic Council and then the first kind of period. Thank you, Petra. We'll now go to uh, an audience question and this is for all the panelists. Um, Andrew, um, I, yep. I hate to say this, but it's, it's 5.30 and, <laughs> and I have to leave. I, I've got another commitment. So I just wanted to thank you and my uh, two fellow panelists for for a, a fascinating discussion. I know that whenever Petra and Thomas are on the uh, agenda, it will be uh, it will be a, a learning experience of the highest order. So thank you to you, Andrew, and thank you to Petra and, and Thomas. And I'm sorry that I have to leave off for for another assignment, so to speak. No, thank you, Rob, and thank you very much for participating with us. It's been a pleasure. Okay. See you next time, hopefully. Bye bye. So Petra, Thomas, we'll we'll, we'll just do one because we are reaching yeah. the end of our time. So we'll just do one question from 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 the audience, and okay. I, and it's it kind of aligns with what we were talking about. You know, the governance structure of the Arctic, the Arctic Council, the Arctic members, and then you know non Arctic nations. Um, there was a question here which I think really hammers home and is a perfect way to conclude. Uh, Greenland just tabled a draft constitution leading to full independence you know, at, at, at the current time. So this person was wondering, you know, would an independent Greenland affect Canada's interest in the Arctic and would it affect, you know, the governance structure of the Arctic overall? Oh, sorry. Uh, Thomas, we'll go with you first. Well, uh, well, uh, uh, Denmark, of course, uh, Greenland's had home rule for, for, quite a while and uh, there's lots of cooperation between uh, uh, Greenland and, and people who live in Nunavut uh, on a host of issues and uh, and the Danes have been uh, promoting Greenland's uh, interests uh, in the law of the sea and then generally foreign policy and uh, and defense um, if uh, if uh, uh, Greenland did uh, eventually become um, a, a, an independent country that's a very small population huge landmass uh, important for the world because of the of melting ice, uh, the real epicenter in many ways of, of rising uh, seas. Um, I, I would think, uh, yes, uh, it, it, it could be easily accommodated. Um, Iceland makes a huge contribution to Arctic issues. It has the Arctic Forum every year, uh, <clears throat> one of the ongoing uh, d discussions. Uh, so um, if, if Greenland did eventually become um, its own country, I think it could be accommodated quite easily into, into the existing Arctic uh, discussions and, and frameworks. There's a lot of de facto cooperation that goes on now, all, every day. Thank you, Thomas. And Petra, we'll have the last word to you. <laughs> That's a really tricky one. It also depends on what exactly it looks like, um, the scenario, because of course the question always arises. So what does it mean in relation vis-a-vis -vis the EU, vis-a-vis -vis NATO, um, all these things. So that, that would really sort of also determine how this plays out. Um, I could see how, you know, in, in general, I mean, there'd be much more interest in, say, collaborating in search and rescue because of 
you know, that kind of uh, uh, um, sort of neighbor piece where I could see some, um, some challenges possibly, because we do know that in the past, the Chinese government has been very active in, um, in sort of uh, buying or you know, being involved in uh, mining and even to some extent oil and gas, but, but they weren't as successful endeavors. And because in Canada, we have of course, a lot of discussion around how do we prevent that, you know, uh, um, that Chinese uh, um, uh, corporations are um, you know, investing in, in the Canadian Arctic, I could see how that could possibly something that would at least create a, a lot of possibilities to talk. Like I could see how from the Canadian side, if it were to be that there's a lot more Chinese investment, which might be necessary if Greenland becomes independent, right? That like, that's the argument that I always hear, Just depending on what the scenario is, is it very important for them to attract outside uh, uh, investment? And it has to be said, when it comes to mineral, um, there are not many big players in the world. And of course the Chinese would be involved, but equally you could see maybe some of the Canadian companies. So that's where I could see an interesting constellation coming up. And then also depending, actually, we haven't talked a lot about the US, but you know, US has also a certain interest in Greenland and, and deal. So it'd be a really interesting scenario in terms of Greenland, the United States and Canada. So I can see uh, it's difficult to predict. Luckily, I don't have to normally as a historian, but I can see how there are quite a number of possible, you know, developments that are that could prove to be highly challenging. But um, in general, I mean, I, I think uh, there's a lot of common interest in search and rescue in, uh, in, in, in indigenous issues as well, um, self-government, these kind of things. Thank you very much, Petra. Well, with that, that brings us to the end of our webinar. Uh, before we conclude, I wanna extend a huge thanks uh, to all the panelists, Thomas, Petra, Rob unfortunately is gone, but I'm sure hopefully he'll to listen to this at a later date. Um, thank you so much for participating in this panel. Without your insights and your opinions, you know, I don't think we would have had a real in-depth discussion on one of the key issues facing Canadian politics, not just within a national security defense perspective, but as we've discussed within, you know, uh, the inter intergovernmental, transnational, um, cross-sending indigenous issues, crossing climate issues, energy issues. It is one of the prominent issues, I think, and topics facing Can Canadians and, and the world as, uh, as a whole. Um, I would also like to extend my gratitude to the attendees for joining us this uh, this evening and for providing the questions that contributed to our discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to get uh, to all of them, but going through them, I did you know, recognize that we, throughout our conversation, did address some of the concerns and questions that were brought up. So thank you very much. And lastly, I just want to inform everyone that this webinar recording will be published on IPD's website and its YouTube channel. So I encourage everyone to subscribe to IPD for a newsletter and to follow IPD on social media so we can update you on future uh, roundtables and events. So thank you very much. <laughs>